I am indeed Janet Gornick, Professor of Political Science and Sociology here at the Graduate Center. And as Chase mentioned, I'm the director of LIS, the Cross National Data Center in Luxembourg, and its satellite office, the LIS Center, that's here at the Graduate Center. LIS is a well known and heavily used data archive that has long provided the ingredients for research on socioeconomic inequalities across countries and over time. As most of you know, I'm sure, interest in inequality has exploded during the last approximately five years. An enormous conversation is now underway in New York City, across the United States, and around the globe uh, about inequality. And it was catalyzed, I think, by the Occupy movement, the global financial crisis, and the Great Recession, and then intensified by new lines of scholarship and journalism and political activism. Economic inequality is now receiving more attention than it has in decades, uh, if ever. Many of us who've worked on economic inequality for a number of years have watched this burst of attention with interest and amazement. And most importantly, we've been gratified to see that diverse initiatives related to inequality, to understanding inequality, are now being institutionalized, broadened, and structured for sustainability. And as Chase mentioned, the Graduate Center is committed to contributing to and responding to this growing conversation. We've hosted a number of programs, as he mentioned, related to income inequality. And most of these have focused substantively on the distribution of income across households and how that's changed and varied, uh, how that's varied across countries and changed over time. And we've been very pleased and proud to host many of the world's top scholars in the field, including Tony Atkinson, Thomas Piketty, Joseph Stiglitz, and Nick Eaton, and our own now Paul Krugman and Bronko Milanovic. So we've learned a great deal about income distribution from these scholars and from their work. I think it's fair to say, though, that this body of work has been limited in at least two ways. First, it has focused largely on high-income countries. And second, much of this highly celebrated work has concerned the economic well-being of households rather than individuals, and that has rendered crucial axes of inequality nearly invisible. That's surely true with regard to gender inequality, which has barely been mentioned in so many of these recent high-profile conversations. So tonight, I'm pleased that we'll shift gears and we'll shine a bright light on several interrelated questions uh, that concern gender inequality, and as we do that, we'll broaden the lens from high-income countries to, as best we can, consider gender disparities throughout countries and regions at various levels of economic development, cross-cutting the global north and south. Feminist scholars have emphasized in recent years that economic gender gaps are hardly uniform within countries. They intersect with class, race, ethnicity, nativity, and disability. They also shape up differently, of course, in different countries and in different parts of the world. So here at the Graduate Center, we began to envision an event this fall related to gender inequality. And we were thrilled when the opportunity fell into our laps to focus tonight's event uh, around the UN Women's New Report, Progress of the World's Women, Transforming Economies, Realizing Rights. Uh, on a personal note, I knew the report was underway. I was actually a contributing researcher. But when the finished report appeared, I was amazed and delighted when I realized how extraordinary and comprehensive it is. So it's a pleasure to partner with UN Women uh, on this event this evening and to have the opportunity to showcase uh, this impressive report. The report itself covers a massive amount of territory, too much for a single evening. Uh, tonight, we won't try to cover the entire report, but instead we'll focus on a section of it that lays out 10 priorities for public action. In fact, we'll focus on only five of them, the five that most squarely address economic disparities. By way of a quick preview, these calls to action include creating more and better jobs for women, reducing occupational segregation and gender pay gaps, strengthening women's income security throughout the life cycle, recognizing, reducing, and redistributing unpaid care and domestic work, and investing in appropriate social services. So starting in just a few minutes, we'll begin by discussing UN Women's decision to cast this massive global study within a human rights framework. We'll then turn to each of these five action items, discussing them one at a time, and we'll close with a consideration of some national and regional specificities. We've, after all of that, then we've saved the last 15 minutes to take questions from the audience. Uh, before we get started, then, let me briefly introduce the panelists. It's really my pleasure to add to the roster of speakers in this series over the last couple of years by introducing these extraordinary scholars. Uh, some of you may have noticed that we're missing one of the panelists who appeared in the publicity uh, for this event up until today. We were expecting Juliana Martinez Franzoni from the University of Costa Rica, but she came down with a flu, and her doctor forbid her from getting on the airplane. 
Uh, we will definitely miss Juliana this evening. I think she's watching the live stream, Juliana we miss you. Uh, especially her expertise on women's work and social policy in Latin America. But we'll do our best uh, to push on uh, and to fill it for her. So, um, first I want to introduce on the far end here, Shara Razavi. Shara is Chief of the Research and Data Section at UN Women, where she served as Research Director of the report that we're highlighting uh, this evening. Before joining UN Women, she headed the Gender and Development Program at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, UR, UNRISD, in Geneva. Shara specializes in gender and development with a focus on women's work, social policy, uh, and care. Next to Shara, in the middle there, is Gita Sen. Gita is Distinguished Professor and Director at Ramalinga Swami Center on Equity and Social Development, uh, and, and the Social Determinants of Health, excuse me, uh, at the Public Health Foundation in India. And she's also Adjunct Professor of Global Health and Population at Harvard's School of Public Health. Gita's work has, for many years, included research and policy advocacy on the political economy of globalization and economic liberalization, the gender dimensions of population policies, and the interplay between gender equity and health and human rights. And finally, closest to me, we welcome Nancy Fulbright. Nancy is Professor Emerita of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her research concerns the interface between feminist theory and political economy with a particular focus on the work of caring for others. She's the author of many books, including the renowned The Invisible Heart, her contributions to the field of feminist economics earned her a MacArthur Award, and it's a particular pleasure to welcome Nancy to the Graduate Center, as I've had the privilege of collaborating with her on several occasions. So let's get started. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to begin by asking each of our panelists to make some very brief remarks uh, to get us started, just about two or three minutes. Uh, each. As I just uh, hinted there from the podium, an interesting and promising development has unfolded in recent years, and that is this new and sustained attention being, being paid to care, to the idea of care. And this attention paid to care is cutting across theoretical and empirical research, advocacy, and policy making. It's encompassing paid and unpaid care, and it considers the care of persons throughout the life cycle, that is from birth uh, to the end of life. So care is only one component of this new UN report, and our discussion tonight will go way beyond issues related to care, but because it's so central to gender divisions of labor, both paid and unpaid, I want to start there. Uh, you've all in different ways contributed to the visibility of the care economy as a research issue and a public policy concern. Can you tell us how and why care issues became so central uh, to your work? So Gita, will you start us off? Um, Sure. Um, I'm a little afraid, though, that what I'm going to say is going to date me. Um, <laughs> but in the 1970s, when I was teaching here at the New School in the graduate faculty in the political economy um, department, um, and we used to have thriving debates um, about um, gender inequality, um, development, um, and so on. Um, that was when wages for housework burst onto the scene. Now, as I said, um, for those of you who've never heard about wages for housework, it was something we used to argue vigorously about um, at that um, time. And wages for housework, in some senses, was a um, counter position to uh, what was largely a position that said that the work that women do at home um, contributes to social reproduction, to the value of labor power, as we used to call it in those days, um, and was important for that, uh, for that reason. None of it was called the care economy um, at that point. Um, but it, of course, grew into and became what then many years later it came to be called the care economy. Um, just one other point I think for in my own trajectory on this work that's important is that when I went back to work in India in 1981, um, uh, pretty soon it became clear to me that the ways in which we've been talking about domestic work, unpaid work and so on, 
in New York was very different from what was important um, or relevant in the Indian context. Um, and it was uh, different in a number of ways. Unpaid work and care work really needed to be distinguished from each other and were not the same, whereas in fact they tended to be almost seen as the same when we were talking about it um, here in New York. So you could have unpaid family labor, which meant that you know the women and children who are at home helping out with uh, sewing garments or whatever else they may be um, and that was very different from what was called domestic work, which was much wider than what then later used to be called, came to be called care work, which included such things as fetching water and fuel and fodder and uh, um, taking care of kitchen gardens and so on, which in some senses would be called subsistence work, but which clearly was connected to feeding people and taking care of them in the household. So the easy sort of distinctions which an advanced capitalist economy made possible between care and non-care, um, or between domestic work and non-domestic work, simply were much muddier when you get into a developing country context. And in my own work, of course, I then went ahead to look at some of that and how one might think about it. So. Um, Gina was largely responsible for my first teaching job as an adjunct at the New School in 1979. So I think our starting points were, were, were pretty similar. Uh, I had from the outset a real interest in measurement and valuation of unpaid work. And uh, I actually got a lot of grief from people, uh, very productive uh, grief and criticism around the issue of, well, it's got to be different. What's different about it? Why are you treating it as though it's exactly the same? And that kind of uh, got me very interested in the distinctive motivations and um, kind of social context in which care work uh, takes place. And it also led me to question the um, assumption that all of care work is unpaid or it only takes place in the home. And so it, it led me into what I thought was a really interesting philosophical uh, exploration of uh, what, what makes care work distinctive, whether it's paid or unpaid. And I think that is largely concerned for the well-being of other people. And it's such, a, it's such an amazing, interesting paradox that um, society depends so heavily on this work, and yet it is so under-rewarded and under-appreciated. And in my view, I think there, there, there are some intrinsic features of it um, that have to do with its motivation that mean that those who provide this work are, are generally in a weaker bargaining position than everybody else. And that's, that seems to be the kind of theoretical core. Um, yeah, I guess reading the work of both these ladies, um, reading a paper, a really interesting paper of Gita Sen with Gordas Benaria on accumulation and social reproduction as a student. And I think for many of us, uh, you know, the production system that was always tied to a sort of system of what we call social reproduction, using that vocabulary. So I was kind of brought up on that uh, way of thinking about uh, unpaid work and unpaid, we didn't call it care work then but reproductive work as we called it. And then the issues became much more sort of palpable when in the 1980s, um, many developing countries were going through what now, I guess in Europe we're seeing in terms of austerity policies. You know, they had structural adjustment policies, which were a response to a kind of global uh, change in the global financial system that basically meant that the international financial institutions came in and demanded measures that were very similar to austerity measures that are being taken in Europe now. And some of the interesting feminist literature coming out saying that these costs, that are, these cuts that are being made through social expenditure, you know, the work of taking care of families and households and doing this work of providing health care, um, providing services, still has to be done. But the outcome of these cuts is that the cost is shifted from the paid economy into the unpaid economy. So for me, you know, that kind of critique that people like Diane Nelson were making, you know, made the care issue really central to thinking about 
you know, economic policies and macroeconomic policies, even though we didn't call it care at that point. And it was later when working on social policies in particular that, you know, I came across the work of, uh, obviously, Nancy Fulbright, but also many others who were working on welfare states who were talking about care and noticing that in the development context and in developing countries, we weren't really calling it care. And we were missing on this whole literature and also bringing in the evidence from developing countries because a lot of what we call, talked about as unpaid reproductive work included care elements, i.e. person-to-person sort of care provisioning. So then we started the, the interesting research project that Anvins, that Juliana, who's not here tonight, was also a part of, to try and really look at care systems in developing countries and look at care, both paid and unpaid, in developing countries and make that visible and bring that experience into the debates on care, on social restructuring and social policy globally because we felt that the developing country experience in a way was missing from the debates on care even though some of that was very much there in the literature on social reproduction and unpaid work, which, as Gita has explained, you know, included care, even though it never used perhaps that vocabulary. Oh, thank you, Shara. I'm going to stay with you for a moment as the, one of the chief uh, architects of this UN report. Uh, the title of the report, as you all can see, Transforming Economies, Realizing Rights, signals something very important, and that is that this report has cast economic gender disparities in a human rights framework. So let me just take a moment to share a passage from the report. International human rights treaties encapsulate a substantive understanding of gender equality that can serve as both a vision and an agenda for action for those seeking to advance women's rights in today's challenging context. While formal equality refers to the adoption of laws and policies that treat women and men equally, Substantive equality is concerned with results and outcomes. That's an opening quote from the report. Uh, human rights, of course, uh, Shara, as you know, takes on different meanings at different times and in different parts of the world. Many Americans, including contemporary scholars of women and work, find it to be a, a perplexing um, concept. But throughout the report, the centrality of human rights and the achievement of substantive equality are inextricably linked from start to finish. So my question for you. Shower, why did the Progress Report take human rights as its framework? Uh, and how do you relate the report's focus on economic and social rights to the more classical rights issues, such as civil and political rights? And then I'll close this complicated question with this. Was the decision to adopt a human rights framework a strategic one? Um, OK, let me start with the boring answer to that question. The boring answer is most of the governments of the world have voluntarily signed up to the international treaties. So it would make sense to look at these international treaties and see if they're delivering on what they've signed up to. That's kind of the boring answer, as I said, which is also part of the truth. But the reality, as we looked, you know, kind of closely for people who have not, uh, for some of us, and I particularly have not specifically worked on human rights, as we started looking through a lot of this literature on human rights and how it's evolving, what became very clear is that there's actually a lot of kind of vision and a lot of wisdom in these international treaties, uh, conventions. And I'm thinking here in particular, for example, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, uh, which talks about substantive equality, which is the big kind of idea in this report. And I'm saying there's a lot of wisdom, wisdom and vision because I think the idea of thinking about substantive equality goes to the heart of many of the issues that I think scholars around the world are, have been debating and struggling with and movements are struggling with. The concept of substantive equality, what CEDAW says, is that what really matters is the concrete enjoyment of rights. That's what substantive equality means, which is different from just formal equality or you know, equality before the law or um, provisions for gender equality put into policy. So what really matters is how that translates into reality and into concrete enjoyment of rights. I think this goes straight to this debate that has been going on for decades about equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. And CEDAW is very clear that both matter and that equality of opportunity is meaningless if you don't see that equality in terms of people's enjoyment of rights. So there, you know, you have this, I think, quite useful kind of concept there, which, has, which was developed, uh, you know, in the CEDAW Convention. Equally important, you know, it draws attention to structural constraints that stop, you know, uh, equal laws, even if they're fair, if gender equality is enshrined in laws. If you have structural constraints and power inequalities and discriminatory social norms, 
these can become sort of hurdles and barriers uh, and stop people from actually realizing and enjoying their rights uh, on the basis of equality. So it draws attention to these barriers and uh, discriminatory social norms rather than assuming that there is a kind of level playing field out there. So it draws attention to all these institutional constraints that I think you know, uh, many feminist scholars have drawn attention to. And that's there in, in CEDAW Convention. And it talks about uh, the need to pay attention not only to kind of direct discrimination, but also what CEDAW talks about as indirect discrimination uh, and unintended discrimination. For example, you know, again, to talk about austerity policies, Austerity policies, you know, policies that cut fiscal you know, spending don't mean to hurt women, but evidence shows that very often in practice when you have those kind of cuts, what it does is that it does hurt particular social groups, low-income people in general, and women in particular because of the way they're structurally located within the economy, because of the way in which they have uh, constraints in terms of accessing market income, because of the fact that they're very often uh, responsible for provision of care for their families. Cuts in public services and, and transfers very often hurt women, uh, in particular, hard, you know, quite hard. And, and those kind of issues really point to this uh, issue around you know, indirect discrimination. And also what CEDAW says, again, on top of that, is the, the sort of responsibility of the state not only to respect rights, but also to protect rights and to fulfill rights. And I think that, again, is quite, a, quite a, uh, an amazing statement in terms of the responsibility of the state to protect harm from being done by third parties. It could be the private sector, it could be others. Uh, and if the markets or the private sector are not able to fulfill certain rights, then it's the duty of the state to step in and ensure that those rights are fulfilled. So there's an amazing agenda there in terms of public action, which we thought you know, the report could tap into. And the fact that there was some really interesting work going on by uh, a range of um, economists, microeconomists, I'm thinking of people like Diane Nelson, uh, James Hines, uh, Radhika Balakrishnan, who've been working on trying you know, at this interface in particular between economic policies, including macroeconomic policies and human rights. We thought it was really important to sort of bring this issue in and make sure that human rights don't stop when we get to a discussion of economic policies that are often seen as technical and having nothing to do with rights. So that was really the impetus behind it. And I think your point about civil and political rights, I think the focus of the report is on economic and social rights, but you know, as human rights uh, uh, principles always talk about, the indivisibility of rights. You know, the fact that social and economic rights are meaningless if you don't have civil and political rights. And we make that very clear in the way we look at substantive equality, uh, which means that, for example, the right to health, the right to health care, this does not kind of cannot stand on its own if you don't also have within the sort of systems that provide healthcare mechanisms for complaints, mechanisms for redress, mechanisms to make sure that people can um, you know can lodge complaints. We know in many healthcare systems around the world, poor people in particular, poor women, women from um, marginalized social groups receive uh, not very equal treatment, if you like. And within a human rights way of thinking, it's you know providing healthcare is not just a question of redressing socioeconomic equalities and providing services in a top-down manner, but it's equally important that there are mechanisms for voice, for complaints, and for redress. So I think the indivisibility is there very strongly. And in terms of our strategic kind of objectives in taking on uh, the human rights framework, I think it was partly also to respond to um, the way in which the sort of mantra of women's economic empowerment has been taken up by a lot of um, actors, uh, by corporate interests, by governments, by donors, who all claim to be empowering women. And we thought, okay, it's great that you're claiming that. Let's now look at actually what, the, what do human rights say about economic and social rights? Does the fact that the claim that you're empowering women, does it mean that the work that is provided meets certain standards of safety, for example? Does it, uh, does it provide a decent uh, a living wage? So you, know, you set out certain criteria based on these principles that you can then push the debate forward and move beyond kind of, you know, claims of empowering women and actually look at concrete rights and say, well, does this actually help women realize and enjoy these rights? Or is it just bringing in women into very problematic you know, global value chains which may actually be undermining uh, 
uh, their rights at work uh, at many different levels. Thank you, Shara. I think we'll have a chance to come back to that. I'm going to push us along. So this human rights framework, UN Women has argued, um, has uh, pushed them and us towards thinking about an action agenda. So we're going to talk about five of the points that they've raised. Um, the first one, as you can see here, we've summarized on the slide, may sound obvious, create more and better jobs for women. Um, a lot of feminists would argue that eradicating women's disadvantage depends first and foremost on equalizing men's and women's engagement in paid work. Until women and men's groups are equally likely to work for pay, women will always remain second-class citizens. In other words, gender equality demands degendering in economic terms, both the supply of and the demand for labor. My question to you all is, do you agree with that premise? And why or why not? Gita, you want to get us started? Um, with the premise of degendering? Is equalizing uh, men's and women's engagement in paid work at the heart of, of achieving gender equality? Um, yes, it is, but I um, will be bold. Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I will say that I think it's a little bit of a pipe dream myself. Um, and and it's a pipe dream right now, because I think before we look at the question of whether we're going to get to equality, we've got to look at what is happening with work itself and with jobs. Um, and I see, in some senses, um, these questions which seems, you know, for, for the longest time, we've somehow thought of the um, advanced economies as holding up a mirror to themselves that the developing countries could look at and follow. I'm afraid we actually may, be, may have turned that and we're in the reverse situation. What I see from where I sit is not just gender inequality, but hugely informal and more informal work is all that's emerging. Um, and in that context, if we don't understand what's happening with jobs and what, um, what is likely to keep happening with work itself, um, asking for greater gender equality in the kinds of jobs that are being created um, isn't going to get us terribly far. And that, I think, is why I, I think of it as a little bit of a pipe dream. I think we need to go back to the drawing board a little bit in terms of thinking about what is happening with work itself. Nancy? Yeah, I have to say, I think that's a, a really good point, and I, think, I do think it's relevant to thinking about uh, what's happening in the U.S. with declining labor force participation rates um, for both men and women. And to me, it, it speaks to what the really great contribution of the report is, which is to move beyond a focus on the labor market per se to this larger question of the social organization of, of care and the kind of critique of neoliberal thinking that markets and markets alone and the labor market in particular are the um, things, <laughs> are the uh, are the uh, kind of solutions. I also think you can't really talk about the supply of and demand for paid labor without thinking of the supply of and demand for unpaid work and that the role of uh, the state and the public sector in helping organize that and, and reorganize that is really key to thinking about um, continued progress on the paid work front. Let me move us on then to the, to the second um, priority, which is very much connected to the first, uh, focusing more on the quality of work as opposed to simply the equalizing the, sort of the quantity. So equalizing men's and women's employment rates won't result in substantive gender equality of women continue to be overrepresented in occupations that are far less remunerative and if gender pay gaps uh, persist. And we know, of course, occupational segregation is an important factor, but not the only one contributing to gender pay gaps. So the UN report lays out several strategies for redu reducing disparities summarized here, revaluing female-dominated occupations, promoting strategies that move women up occupational ladders, uh, encouraging women to study STEM, and so forth. Which of these are most promising, uh, and where, and which are the hardest um, to achieve? Shama, why don't we start with you? You've thought about this a lot. Yeah, on the occupational segregation, actually, the um, 
the not so, di not so uh, good news is when we look at occupational segregation over the past two decades, it is not changing. I mean, really it's not. And in fact, over the past decade, if anything, female-dominated jobs have become more feminized and male-dominated jobs have become more masculinized. So the news is not good in terms of doing away with it. And even though we have uh, some of these wonderful, you know, recommendations because we think something needs to be done about it because, as we all know, uh, occupational segregation is one of the factors that, you know, lies behind the gender-based um, wage gaps. So it is something we need to seriously think about. But in terms of what can be done about it, I mean, the idea, for example, of getting more women to study science uh, subjects, STEM fields, I mean, it's a great idea, but we also know the problem is once women enter those fields in terms of occupations, there's what economists call leaking pipes. So they very often don't uh, survive very long in some of those occupations for various reasons to do with the work environment, to do with the pressures of the work. Also, uh, I think it's interesting in that some countries that have tried to put in quotas to put, bring, you know, create more of a mixed uh, male, female within particular sectors. I mean, I'm thinking of Norway here, uh, which for, I think it was in um, 1998, if I believe, if I'm right, they put in, a, they had a ministerial decree to bring in more men into uh, care work as kindergarten teachers. And after 20 years, they all they managed to do was, I think they ended up having something like 12% men in kindergarten work, um, care work in, in that particular sector. And where they seem to show greater success is, for example, of bringing women into corporate sector, where over a very short period they managed to meet the 40% quota. But the real challenge of trying to create more of a mixed uh, male-female um, sort of uh, workforce in some of the feminized sectors, you know, has been has been difficult. So although I think it's really important, I'm not sure if there are any magic bullets and if there are any easy ways of doing it. So rather than try and get more, you know, I mean, I think we should continue to try and create that mix, but also it's really important to revalue the jobs that women are doing. You know, it's not just science. Societies don't just need scientists and engineers. They also need nurses and carers and child minders, and it's important that we properly value those jobs. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit more optimistic than you are about um, <laughs> improvements in, in I, I think I, I have seen over the course of my career a lot of normative change, and I see this particularly among my undergraduate students who uh, have a very different set of expectations and ideals than, than my generation ha has had. So I, I think there's a whole portfolio of policies. N none of them are really easy. Um, we, we need more research on which ones work and in which context. I think it's really hard to figure that out. Um, I completely agree with you that revaluing care work and, and improving the quality of those and, 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 and building coalitions with consumers who stand to benefit from higher quality uh, care provision, I think, is, has got to be a key part of the overall strategy. Okay, let me push on, and uh, we'll, let's move to a different, the third action priority. I know time is tight here. Uh, this is shifting gears somewhat. So the third um, priority that they have identified, strengthen women's income security throughout the life cycle. The report concludes that due to women's unequal employment histories and their predominance in low-paid work, as we've said, they're particularly vulnerable to economic insecurity and financial dependence. Social protection systems, we know, can diminish these disadvantages, both during the working age years and, of course, in the older years. Um, and they've identified the crucial, some several crucial public policies, strengthening uh, employment protection, uh, providing child allowances, and so forth. And very important, reforming contributory pensions to remove gender Biases. So the overarching question that I would pose, is it realistic to think that economic disparities that stem from different levels and types of engagement in paper can be rectified by these kinds of social protections? Or to put it another way, if social protection systems fully compensate women, would employment gaps no longer matter? Uh, that's the larger question. Nancy, let me direct this to you. I know you've thought a lot, uh, influenced my thinking a lot, um, often noting that care is not just about labor time, it's also about the transfer of money, both within the family and the community and um, through the state. So what does a gender egalitarian system of income security look like? Well, so in two minutes or less. <laughs> yeah, it's such, a, it's such a great question. I guess the first thing I would say is I think we need to be very careful in the design of public support 
prepare not to reinforce traditional gender roles. And I know your own work and that of, of many other people has shown that this is definitely a risk. So, um, you know, if you provide uh, uh, paid family leave for work that are too long, or that are directed only to mothers and not to fathers, you can end up making the, the, the problem worse, essentially, than, than making it better. But I think there's a lot of evidence that well-designed public policies and support for care can, can reduce uh, gender inequality. Uh, and there's also a lot of evidence that class differences, inequality, racial ethnic differences, uh, inequalities based on citizenship, also or have to be really central to the design of these uh, public policies, because you can end up in a regime where you can and I think this has happened in some instances where public policies can exploit low-wage immigrant women um, to solve the problem on the cheap. So it, it really requires a, 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 a pretty comprehensive approach to thinking about uh, social inequality in general uh, beyond just the gender differences. Peter, you want to add to that? Sure. Um, I think you know. I think one of the um, one of the things going back to something Shara said right at the beginning is that one of the strengths of this report is that it actually ties the question of macroeconomic policy um, and whether or not you have the money in times of fiscal austerity to be able to pay for good social protection and what that might uh, what that might mean. One of the arguments that we've been trying to build, um, again, in developing country contexts, is that we need to think of social protection not simply in the sense of welfare, but um, as having three potential kinds of effects. Obviously, it supplements income, depending on what kind of uh, program one is thinking about. Um, it can, in fact, be a job-creating mechanism, so in situations where you really have a problem with unemployment and underemployment, it's not just putting money into people's hands, it's actually giving them work, um, and the Indian Right to Work program, uh, which, which guarantees to every household, and it's women who typically take advantage of this, 100 days of work in a year, and if there is no work available, they can actually ask for that from the, uh, from the government, is a very important element in this in times when jobs are very difficult to get. But there's a third critical element, which is that um, it actually can act as a macroeconomic income multiplier. Um, and it's being increasingly argued that quite apart from that we shouldn't be looking at this as welfare, but in, but in very difficult times for economic growth, when economies are not pulling out of the 2008 crisis um, in any rapid way at all, the income multiplier effects of social protection should be and could be as important as the um, job creation and getting money into people's hands. Just to add a small point to that, um, I totally agree about you know exactly you know the devil is in the detail. How do you design these transfers so that they don't have the disincentive, so that they don't reinforce you know the unpaid work as women's work? And I totally agree with um, Gita's point about you know the importance of these to see some of these transfers really also as social investments, if you like, and they do have these multiplier effects and can be particularly useful when economies are you know downturn. But at the same time also one other thing we, we sort of put in the report based on a study that was on lifetime earnings uh, of women and men based on four countries. It was Sweden, and France, and Germany, and Turkey. And what that study found was that um, the action, even though the social protection system and transfers can make a difference in terms of closing of lifetime earnings, but the real factor that makes a big difference is in terms of people's access to the labor force, labor force participation, and wages. So social protection systems are useful in terms of closing some of that lifetime gaps uh, in income between women and men, but you also really need to do something about the work and about you know, the um, quality of work, the pay, the, 
earnings as well as uh, people's capacity to participate. And for that, you know, again, some of these social investments are necessary in order to facilitate women's in particular participation in the labor force if we're thinking of investments in care services, for example. Let me turn our attention now to the fourth action item. This one, as ambitious as the first three. Uh, recognize, reduce, and redistribute unpaid care and domestic work. This takes us back to where we started. Um, unequal divisions of unpaid care uh, and domestic work are central to this report, not surprisingly. Very um, quickly, uh, the, the report, this section begins with the claim that unpaid care and domestic work contribute to economic development and human well-being, but the burdens of doing this work uh, are unequally distributed, it goes on. Um, the report calls for recognizing and redistributing unpaid work and doing that through several measures, as you can see on the slide, increasing investments in infrastructure, strengthening social services, supporting unpaid caregivers, and so forth. I, I noted that you uh, need to begin by saying that sort of uh, equalizing men's and women's engagement in paid work might be um, a pipe dream. Uh, people often say that about this as well, I think, and even more so. Um, so the question is, can these levers really alter divisions of unpaid labor? Some would argue that trying to redistribute unpaid work is a hopeless endeavor, and maybe it's better to recognize that gender gaps in unpaid work, especially in family caregiving, will never go away. And to simply protect women economically instead, in other words, maybe we should accept gender differences but render them costless. Shara, what do you think of that claim? Yeah, just maybe to start by saying some of the policy recommendations that are up there, and it's really about shifting, I think, the re, or rather redistributing unpaid care between households, families on the one hand, and society on the other. So a lot of those investments you know, in services and in infrastructure, what it does is that it's society as a whole by paying taxes, by financing these services, is taking on some of that burden and relieving families and households. So that's a great achievement, if, you know, and, and I think some of that is actually happening. Um, in particular, I think, you know, at a time when in many developed countries we're seeing a kind of erosion of services, care services, some of that, you know, that, that were available, some of the transfers are being cut. You know, in Latin America over the past decade, there has been quite a lot of significant changes, I think, in the provisioning of care services, for example. We don't hear about that a lot. We hear a lot about conditional cash transfers in Latin America, but countries like Chile and Argentina and Mexico, using different methods, have, or have invested in care services, and I think that's something worth emphasizing here. But your questions about redistributing uh, unpaid care work within families and households, uh, maybe again, I'm being very pessimistic here, Nancy. I do think that it, it entails changing social norms, and I'm sure that one can see a generational change in that. Younger men want to engage more, you know, with children, with their children. Less so when it comes to elderly care, it seems. Uh, less engagement from men in terms of taking care of their elderly parents. Um, but also, I think, you know, we've had some policies like the daddy quotas in some of the Nordic countries that are symbolically important and that provide some carrots and sticks, you know, to have more men take on some of that work. But in terms of seeing a big change, um, I think these will be very slow changes. And the only thing I think one can say is that, you know, for many developing countries in contexts also where a lot of men are feeling their kind of masculinity is being undermined by unemployment, structural unemployment in some countries, and that's probably true you know, in developed countries too, in the US as well. Those are not probably the best conditions for reproductive bargains and for sort of sharing of uh, unpaid care work, perhaps, um, because it may be more difficult uh, for men who feel their masculinity is under question to take on more of this very feminized work. But maybe not, but we don't seem to be seeing a huge shift happening. But also we're very aware that even in time use surveys and other surveys, a lot of men who do care work don't seem to be reporting it. So maybe that's also an issue. Um, but I, I'm sure others can say more. Actually, I, I would just add that there's been some research in the US that actually did show that during the economic crisis, you know, it was often dubbed the man session and so forth, that it was often men, men who were first hit with the wave of unemployment, that there was some, uh, classic role reversal um, with some men who lost their jobs then taking over the primary caregiving role while their female partners remained in the unpaid work. Apparently there was some, there's some fairly substantial evidence for that in the U.S. anyway. And Nancy or Gita? No, I mean, 
I agree that the change is, is slow, and I think it's it's fr it's a frustrating process. But I I think there are, there are some big uh, kind of really major trends that are are pushing in that direction, and one of those is uh, demographic change and fertility decline. Another is just technological change uh, in uh, the organization of, of housework and provision of of care services, and I also think that uh, it's kind of household bargaining and kind of cultural bargaining over whose responsibility care is is, is kind of moving forward. Uh, I guess I also think that there's uh, this really important analogy between awareness of the natural environment and the degradation and destabilization of the natural environment and the concerns about the care environment and the degradation and destabilization of our families and communities. And so the, the parallel works. I think that things, issues like global climate change, it's very frustrating that there's not a stronger, more unified response. On the other hand, I think there's a growing awareness of the need uh, to um, re really mobilize collectively around the need to address that problem. And I. I think the same thing is true of, of uh, uh, people's concerns about the future of family and community care uh, responsibilities. So I, I think, um, in a way, as they become more fraught and more, more difficult, uh, they also uh, increase, awareness of them is, is increased. And I, I think that it's going to be a big theme in the, in the years to come. Um, Yes, but no, <laughs> not last word. Uh, hopefully not. Um, but again, um, the um, I think it depends very much on two things: whether we're going to see the kind of normative change that both um, Sharon and um, uh, Nancy spoke about. Um, um, one. Men usually get into care work when technology comes in. Um, technology of one kind or another seems to lift and raise the normative value of anything that's done. So if you're doing the same thing with a broom versus doing it with a vacuum cleaner, um, <laughs> uh, it makes a big, uh, big difference. Um, in fact, I'm reminded of a friend in Fiji, who's, who we were just talking about, you know, whether she, whether her husband, what does he do? Does he help out at home? And she said, he's actually pretty good. He will sweep the house, but before he does it, he makes sure he draws all the curtains so nobody from the outside can see him doing it. So um, I think it depends very much on technology, and of course technology and the possibility of either private or public investment in technology depends on the underlying economic uh, um, environment. And the other thing is whether it's considered, to use Ruth Pearson's um, language, whether it's cuddly care, dirty care, um, you know, high-tech care, you know, it depends very much which of those it is. What kind of care are we talking about? Are we taking, talking about, um, I mean, demographics may change whether or not we have children, but then we have old people um, in the home, in lots and lots of countries and nowhere for them to go, um, except remain, remain at home. And so who takes care? with increasing longevity and what kind of care that is. And I think it's going to be very hard to see the norms around that kind of actual hardcore caring work changing easily because you can't technologize it much anyway. Thank you. So men like gadgets, is that what you're saying? Um, sort of, kind of a thesis. Um, Okay, the fifth priority, this is also very large. Gita, I'm going to direct this mostly to you because this has really been your life's work. Uh, the report notes that public services are essential for the realization of women's rights and the achievement of substantive uh, equality in many areas. A central concern here is with health services. Without adequate health services, the report argues, women and girls struggle to realize their sexual and reproductive
So you've spent your life, of course, thinking about the interplay between gender equity and health and women's human rights. In what ways are adequate health services uh, crucial to the pursuit of gender equality in both more and less developed economies? Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, this is um, what's calling, giving me a really soft ball to play with, with this kind of audience. And given the current situation in this country, in terms of whether or not you defund Planned Parenthood, um, I would imagine that, um, uh, I mean, there's so many commonalities um, uh, across um, high income and lower income countries in, in relation to the question of uh, women's bodies, women's health, and human rights. Um, and um, in some senses, I suppose we are now at the stage where um, we're fighting really bitterly about having it recognized as human rights, um, uh, having health services recognized as human part of human rights. Um, um, and ironically, you, I mean, there are lots of ironies in this. I remember one argument um, last year at, in some very heated debate in the United Nations around migrants. This was pre the current uh, European um, wave, um, but it was actually related to the European Union. And the European Union was caught in a cleft stick on the question of whether or not they would agree that providing health services to migrants um, was something that they would agree to. Um, and so they then came up with this fine distinction, uh, which of course everybody thought was ridiculous, um, between, oh yes, we recognize the human rights of migrants, <coughs> but we don't recognize their right to health services. Um, so, of course, as I told you, I mean, most of us would think that that was absurd, but that was the best that they could do. So that that's, it's, the, it's in the actual provision of things like health services that the rubber starts hitting the road when it comes to gender equality, women's human rights, and women's bodies. Uh, because that's when one actually sees whether or not there's going to be funding for programs, whether what is going to be the compass of the programs and whether they are going to advance uh, women's autonomy and agency in accessing health services or whether they're going to cut them back. And the biggest challenges, as we know, that we face um, in this context right now, certainly in this country, of course, it's the never-ending uh, battle around abortion. Um, but in, elsewhere, it's also the big challenge of young people's rights, particularly young women's rights to be able to access health services without getting five people having to sign off um, on whether or not they can access those services. Um, and it's also, of course, around sexual rights, um, the rights of people who are not in heterosexual relationships to be able to access health services openly and, um, and, um, and freely. And I think that um, in this context, the, um, the realization of the human right to health, um, which um, when stated at one level sounds like motherhood and apple pie, um, has actually become hugely fraught um, in a lot of countries, in a lot of contexts, and a lot of situations um, because of these things. And of course, as I said, um, you're very aware of it continuously. Um, in the relatively narrow frame of abortion in this country, um, but scratch that surface and there's a lot of other things um, behind it as well. I'm going to start to bring us uh, to a close by turning your attention to regional uh, and national, some national specificities. Um, even the most cursory look at women and work and care across countries reveals immediately that progress towards gender equality varies enormously across countries and that there are some notable patterns um, at the regional level.
So um, we see already in the, in the report an enormous, an enormous um, array of statistics showing us uh, national cross-national variation in many of these um, outcomes that we're talking about. I want each of you to reflect on parts of the world that you know best, uh, and I'm asking if you would characterize some recent gains, central challenges, paradoxes, and so forth. We do not, our expertise here on the stage does not cover the whole world, um, but we do have some uh, very deep knowledge about certain regions here. Shara, would you talk a little bit about the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa? Well, women's labor force participation is very low by global standards, around 20%. It's risen slightly in the last 30 years. Um, what are the greatest economic challenges um, facing women in the MENA region, and which countries stand out as those where women's economic and social rights are more fully realized, and, and why? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, well, the data, you're absolutely right, even though we may have some reservations about the data, especially when you do cross-regional comparisons, so I'm sure uh, other colleagues can talk about that. But there is a truth that in the data that we have, the Middle East and North Africa region, the female labor force participation is very low. And it has increased, but from a very low base. Uh, and I think, you know, obviously the region is very diverse, one cannot generalize, but in three minutes I may have to do some generalization here. There has obviously been, there, there are certain factors that seem to kind of, you know, converge together to create this, um, this the disincentives and constraints in terms of women's access to a sort of paid work. For some of the countries, you know, historically, at least from the 80s and 90s, you know, being kind of oil-based economies, um, rentier states, uh, created what some economists talk about as the Dutch disease, so disincentives and structural problems in terms of having, a, let's say, a manufacturing sort of base, where which would uh, have attracted you know, more women into the labor force. Uh, so the fact that these were oil-based economies kind of militated against that. But also the fact that there was this kind of social contract, if you like, between the state and men, actually, around a very strong family wage, which was uh, a relatively high wage, but a family wage, which uh, again uh, kind of conspired against women's labor force participation as well as institutional particularities, like, for example, the fact that maternity leave uh, in most of the countries in the region, except for, I believe, Tunisia, Jordan, and Morocco, and Algeria, is financed entirely by employers, which again creates huge disincentives in terms of women's labor force participation, plus the fact that you have um, these family laws are, that are very restrictive in terms of women's access to the labor market. You know, uh, in terms of family laws, in many countries, women need permission in order to uh, access the labor force. We know, of course, that women get around discriminatory labor law, uh, family laws, and other kinds of laws. But the combination of these factors has, you know, been uh, something that has really uh, sort of fed into the kind of low levels of labor force participation that we see in the region. Now, that particular social contract between the state and men kind of has fallen apart in the context of globalization, economic liberalization. And some people would say, you know, this was kind of the prelude to the kind of so-called Arab Spring and the conflicts that emerged in the region. Um, but also, I think in that context, economic necessity has pushed many women into the labor force uh, in terms of informal work, which is growing uh, in many countries. Uh, but also, I think, very important to sort of bring into this rather bleak picture the fact that in terms of the state's capacity to offer infrastructure and services, the militarization in many of the countries, the you know, enormous amount of public resources that are spent on military uh, expenses. I mean, I have some figures that for like Saudi Arabia, it's um, something like 25% uh, of public expenditure goes to military spending compared to 6% on health expenditures. Uh, in Bahrain, 16% on military spending compared to 8.7% on health. So these are kind of, you know, again, adding force uh, to uh, the state not being able to provide some of the infrastructure that would be helpful in terms of enabling women to access labor for labor market, and also the remaining constraints through family laws and the political economy constraints that may have somewhat uh, become less forceful uh, in the context of um, the countries becoming perhaps less dependent, some of them, on uh, the oil income. But overall, I think this does not bode well. Uh, but there are, I mean, 
looking at the work of someone like Valentine Morata, who has worked on uh, these countries from a gender perspective. I mean, uh, the more positive picture seems to be emerging from countries like uh, Morocco and uh, even better, Tunisia, which have reformed the family laws. In, those, in both countries, they have had reforms of family laws. And also, generally, the um, women's access to the labor market has been greater, and the state has been able to do more in terms of provisioning of, of services, of uh, not so much care services, but at least of taking more of a role in terms of financing of maternity leave, for example, which I think um, make them relatively interesting countries to look at from that perspective. And, and also not to forget the activism of women's movements in those countries in, in terms of enabling some of these changes to happen, which has been a really important force. Uh, Gita, let me ask you to reflect on India. Women's paid work in India has been stagnant in recent years, um, according to the report and other findings. Why do you think that India's globalizing economy is not providing more jobs for women in a way that other countries are, say, in some of the Asian countries and in Latin America um, as well? Are women's organizations in India concerned about the stagnation of women's employment? What, what do you see going on there? Um, hugely concerned. Um, and hugely concerned for multiple reasons. Uh, we actually have been seeing a upward trend in women's work participation rates um, for quite a while. Um, and, but in the period post-2008 particularly, it just seems to have gone in the other direction. Now, male work participation rates have also declined some during this period, but when, when one looked, analysis that's looked at it says that um, what's happening is that boys are going into education. That's not what's happening with girls. You cannot explain the fall as girls going more into school and education. I actually have begun calling this the canary in the miners' cage mm -hmm. um, because I think that, see, India has been growing, um, and I sort of put the numbers together, but let's just take the period from about 2000 on. Our economic reforms began about 10 years before that, um, and there was a period of sort of up-down with the, with the economic growth rates. But if you take about the period from 2000 on, we've been growing at a pretty steady clip um, of um, about anywhere between six to eight and sometimes even touching 9% a year. Not Chinese rates, but rates that any economy would be thrilled to have. Um, and the, however, the uh, employment elasticity of GDP growth, which for those of you who are not economists, 1% of GDP growth, how much does it translate into in terms of increases in employment? So the employment elasticity of um, GDP was already only 0.3% um, before 2000. And after 2000, uh, before 2008, after 2008, it's fallen further to 0.15. Now, this means that we pretty much are not creating jobs with all of the growth that's taking place. And that's why I'm saying that the question of what is happening with jobs and work and technology um, in a context of the kind of globalization changes that we are seeing taking place um, and where we are seeing women ending up in, in India is in fact more and more marginal kinds of work. They've been pushed out of even the low-end work that they were in before. Um, and that's why I'm calling it the canary in the miners' cage. We are not paying attention to this. We're not going, you know, India is going to be in serious, uh, it's already in pretty serious trouble when it comes to jobs and work. It's going to be in much worse trouble. As we, um, as we go on. Nancy, can you say something about 
United States. Uh, the U.S., as you know, and I know, and many of us know, is famously a laggard among high-income countries with regard to policies that help parents, in particular, to provide paid work and family. Uh, possibly less well-known um, is that women's employment outcomes relative to those of other rich countries are not especially good, and they're slipping uh, in cross-national terms over time. Um, what the heck is going on in the United States? Why is the U.S. such an outlier? Well, I think there's a lot of empirical evidence that uh, work-family policies have created a wall um, that makes it very difficult for women's labor force participation rates to increase. That from 1970 to the mid-90s, very rapid rates and very high relative to other countries. And uh, since then, really leveled off and, and declined. So I do think there is a supply side constraint. I also think it's true once you reach a certain level, it's hard. It becomes uh, particularly hard uh, to provide substitutes for the work that women were providing in the home. But I also very much agree with what Nita is saying. I think there's a global labor demand issue that employment growth uh, is is lagging. That there's been a change kind of in the political economy of the labor market that's put uh, wage earners everywhere uh, in a very vulnerable position. And I think that's something we really need to address as part of the larger problem. I guess I, one thing I would add, though, is that I never like using GDP or GDP growth rates as a, a kind of an indicator of, of, um, of success because they are very much mismeasured indicators of the total value of goods and services produced. So one of the reasons we had rapid GDP growth in the U.S. from 1970 to mid-90s was that more women were entering the labor force. So that was what was driving the GDP growth because their work was not being counted uh, when it was unpaid and then they reallocated their time to pay work in it and it, it was being paid. So changing our whole accounting system uh, to better understand the relationship between employment and the total value of goods and services produced rather than just goods and services bought and sold got to be a big part of the whole uh, process. No, I, I would agree with you on that, but that's not what's been happening in India. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, but that's a crucial point to just to underscore. I was going to say Nancy wrote the book on this. Nancy literally wrote the book on this. Um, as, as women move into paid work, we do often forget in our accounting frameworks that they're withdrawing their unpaid labor from the home, and that has an effect on well-being. We tend not to count it as if it's invisible, thus valuing it at zero. Um, on that note, I'm going to turn uh, it over to the audience for a few questions. We have about almost 10 minutes, a little bit less than I hoped for. Uh, questions, microphones in the aisles, so I think we can take probably two or three questions. When you get to the microphone, please tell us who you are. And if you give a speech, keep it down to 10 seconds. <laughs> on 
obligations or responsibilities for care. And I think it's created a kind of moral and political vacuum in which orthodox religion and fundamentalist religion um, have been in some ways strengthened or, or reinforced. Uh, that, that sometimes we're, we're sort of presented with two alternatives, which is that, that, that uh, religious orthodoxy should dictate that women provide all the care, or we can live in a society where people can choose to care or not, you know, depending on what their utility functions are, or something like that. So I, I, I do think there's a cultural, that, that globally we're undergoing a kind of really big and complicated cultural uh, trauma. I think the point about the sort of fragility of masculinities, I mean, it's well taken, but there are also 
you know, I mean, those normative changes and people's uh, sort of expectations in terms of what sort of stereotypes of men's roles and women's roles, all those cultural issues do make a difference. But also, I think what we're talking about here are the sort of also structural kind of constraints. You know, the fact that when you have a very long working hour culture, uh, it makes it very difficult, not only for men who may be working in the finance sector, but also for men and women who may be working, you know, and trying to earn a living income by having to put in incredibly long hours to do any kind of parenting and care work. And then within a very, you know, unequal society, what happens, something we haven't talked about yet, uh, the way in which much of that care work is delegated down to people, you know, whether it's migrant workers, uh, women who are coming from other countries, sometimes with, you know, highly educated women who take on some of this, the dirty, um, to use the word that uh, Ruth Pearson is using, sort of the dirty uh, care work and the bits of care work that we don't like to do. So we do the person-to-person -person care, the storytelling, but a lot of the other work that is, you know, a bit more, kind of involves more drudgery, we try and delegate to others who happen to be around and who will do this work for a low wage because of lack of other choices and because of the constraints that they face. So I think the sort of, it's important to bring into this conversation also the way in which the global inequalities uh, don't uh, also contribute to a lack of kind of um, divisions of labor within households that both men and women live in, and they provide an easy opt-out, you know, if you have the possibility of hiring a nanny for a relatively, you know, low income and low wage, then that kind of resolves that issue of not having to bargain about it every weekend in terms of who does this work and who does that work. i take one last question over here. Um, my name is Joan Hoffman, I'm also from John Jay, but my field is uh, sustainability. And you did have a brief uh, mention of the environment, but it does seem to me that um, the crisis we're having in environmental care has particular uh, repercussions for women in their ability to provide care, access to water, and uh, things like that. I wasn't sure if that was addressed in the report. Yes, I know you've thought about this. You want to? Or anyone, or yeah. In the reports, I think when we talk about care, we don't uh, necessarily, uh, we have actually in, in the context of many lower income households and in terms of lower income countries, that kind of work of carrying water, which gets more arduous, you know, as um, in parts of the world, you know, even the little access to water that there was, you know, there it becomes even less accessible that people have to go longer distances. We have even some data on that and the way in which that work is divided. And very often when it's arduous and it involves carrying water, as Kito was saying, there's very little technology. Uh, it is very often women and girls who do it. And we have um, some data on that, the way in which that work is uh, being divided. And there has been quite a lot of literature, but not reflected in this report in terms of also um, sort of the environmental care, you know, as we see degradation of environment, actually that does uh, very often add to the kind of unpaid, unpaid work that um, is carried out by low income households in particular and women and girls within those households more specifically. So we do refer to it, but it's not a big dimension of the report, but maybe colleagues will. Actually, I think our work and care for the evening is done. We are three minutes over. So, Shara, thank you and to your team at UN Women, and thank you, Gita, and thank you, Nancy.